climate action in food and agriculture, resilience and reversal. I'm welcoming our friend and moderator, Tiffany Patton on the virtual stage. So please, Tiffany, join us. A lifelong foodie and turn activist, Tiffany of Real Food Media has been writing, researching and advocating for food system change for more than seven years. She leads several areas of educational programming, communication strategy, and engagement at Real Food Media and co-produces and co-hosts the Real Food Reads and Foodopias podcast. So Tiffany, just a warm welcome and thank you for being with us today. I'm so excited to welcome you and all the other panelists that are with us, Albert Strauss, Anna LaPay, and Scott Cheng Fleeman. Tiffany and everybody, please take it away. The stage is yours. Hi, uh, thank you so much for that really warm welcome. Um, thanks for joining us for Food Funded as well. So I'm Tiffany Patton. I'm coming to you from my home on occupied Huchin land, home of Ohlone people in Oakland, California. I'm a co-director at Real Food Media, where we use communications and storytelling strategies to support food and agriculture groups around the country and show that a just and sustainable food system is possible and it's in the works. And so the people who are doing that work uh, are here with us today. Um, everyone who's attending this and the panelists who I'm excited to introduce you to. So we have Scott Chang Fleeman, an orga organic farmer in West Marin County. His farm, Shaoshan Farm, focuses primarily on heritage East Asian produce. And he's part of a movement of young Asian farmers in California who are reclaiming space and doing the important work of sharing the diversity of Asian crops. We also have Anna LaPay, Anna is a national best-selling author, a renowned advocate for sustainability and justice along the food chain, and an advisor to funders investing in food system transformation. And I get the pleasure of working with her at Real Food Media, one of the organizations that Anna has co-founded. And then we also have Albert Strauss, founder and CEO of Strauss Family Creamery and an organic dairy farmer who has been championing environmentally sustainable practices for decades while also supporting a growing network of small scale organic dairy farms in the North Bay. So thank you, you all for joining us. Um, today's focus at Food Funded is on climate. And I feel like this climate, the talk around climate crisis is getting increasingly urgent. So most of California is already in a drought, wildfire season has started early. Also, we now have a wildfire season and heat waves are becoming increasingly deadly. Many of us here know that we can't talk about the climate crisis, how to mitigate it, how to build our resiliency to withstand it without talking about food and agriculture. And we know that industrial agriculture contributes significantly to this climate crisis. But if we use ecological practices for farming and manage land ecologically, we can sequester up to one fifth of our current carbon emissions. And many small scale farmers around the world have been using these practices for centuries. But now ideas of regenerative agriculture have been have um, become or are becoming mainstream and are being used by large corporations who are also big players in the industrial food system. Corporations like Cargill and General Mills. And so this sort of begs the question, what is regenerative agriculture and what are its limits? So today we're gonna to talk about the impacts of the climate crisis in California, what regenerative agriculture looks like here and the limits and possibilities of regenerative ag. So first, I'd like to ask y'all, um, what does regenerative agriculture mean to you? And uh, Anna, can we start with you? Sure, it's really great to be here. Uh, hi, Tiffany, Scott, Albert. I feel uh, I should confess uh, my family and I had some uh, Strauss family creamery yogurt this morning at breakfast uh, with our uh, granola. So I feel a particular kinship with you here, Albert. Uh, so you know, to me, when I think about regenerative agriculture, it's it's two things actually in my mind. I mean, one to me, it's a a, a resonant word that uh, is clearly taken off, uh, and I think means this. What I think a lot of us coming to this call feel the potential is in farming and agriculture to uh, regenerate our soils, to connect people together, to think about how to have a kind of agriculture that's good for people and planet. And I think there is, though, the flip side to the term, which you alluded to in your introduction, Tiffany, which is you know, how we're already starting to see this term being used because there is no official definition. It's not codified in law. You know, there are ways in which this term is already being used to kind of, I would argue, greenwash what, uh, what, uh, what path forward we might see. Um, and just to give you one example of this, um, probably some of you maybe were even involved with lobbying around or working around 
around the Growing Climate Solutions Act, uh, a bill that would channel this interest in regenerative agriculture into soil carbon markets. And it was interesting to see in uh, uh, the lobbying around that act and, uh, and who was uh, really kind of pushing for it that some of the biggest agribusiness interests in the world uh, were part of that. So you had a pesticide company Bayer uh, talking about how this act could be a way to get more farmers to use their herbicides uh, and, uh, and, and get benefits from doing so. And so, you know, I think as we really celebrate the, the growth of interest in regenerative agriculture, the deepening of the understanding of these connections between our food systems and climate change, that at the same time, we really wanna be careful that we are really clear about what we mean by regenerative agriculture. And that when we're talking about regenerative agriculture, we're not talking about a get out of jail free card for pesticide companies to market their products in new clever ways. Um, so, uh, so to me, yeah, I would just, um, say that it, it symbolizes both this excitement that I'm seeing around think, uh, these connections between food and climate, as well as what we see so often when there's growing public understanding about an issue, about how companies can co-opt it and how we have to be very careful about that. Thanks, Anna. Uh, Scott, can you share with us what regenerative agriculture means to you? Sure. Um, thanks for having me here today. Uh, very excited to be able to participate in this panel. Um, yeah, I think Anna hit on a lot of the really big points that I feel um, resonate with the term regenerative agriculture as well. Um, you know, honestly, for me, I I don't like identify as a regenerative farmer. I, I've never really used that term, even though some people have used that term to describe the work that we do here. Um, I think that it's, you know, just another the next buzzword, um, like Anna mentioned, kind of toothless, no real definition, like sustainable or green uh, can use be used a lot in greenwashing. Um, you know, even to the extent that organic does have national standards, you know, we know there's tons of organic farms that uh, have terrible land practices that are detrimental to land people and soil and water and climate. Um, I think, um, you know, hopefully when we're trying to think about actually regenerating our food system, um, we can move past just the new buzzwords or the new um, maybe labels or uh, certifications and things like that. And I think uh, sometimes these um, greenwashing can really take aside from the issue of uh, really regenerating our food system and our land and our climate should be starting from a place of racial equity, I believe. Um, and sometimes that can get lost in this greenwashing. Um, what I do like about the term and uh, some of the ideas of regenerative agriculture um, principally being that we're moving away from sustaining something and the idea of okay, we're gonna sustain this level of resource use and land use and sustain agriculture the way it is. And I think regeneration really brings to mind the idea that we need to be growing something entirely new and that we're not going back to something that used to be how it was or continuing the, the practices the way that they are. And again, for me, I think that that regeneration looks like uh, racial equity. I think it looks like uh, reparations for black farmers. I think it looks like um, honoring traditional ecological knowledge of indigenous farmers and indigenous land protectors and extending the idea of what agriculture is beyond colonial ideas of farms and ranches and extending that to um, land management and, you know, salmon fisheries and uh, elk herd management and things like that, that are real legitimate means of food production for people that, um, yeah, don't, don't promote the dichotomy and the the uh, this hard line between this is agriculture and this is conservation. Awesome, thanks, Scott. Uh, and finally, Albert, what does regenerative agriculture mean to you? Thanks for inviting me. Um, so I want to kind of look at the bigger context. Um, what I'm trying to do is create a, a vision and a practice of a sustainable, economically sustainable and viable organic farming system that's good for the planet and our communities. At the same time, providing high quality food for our, our, our um, communities uh, locally and regionally. And um, so I also have a, a, a goal. So we have, we were the first certified organic dairy in Creamery West the Mississippi River, first 100% organic Creamery in the United States. And um, I have a, I gave a goal to my sustainability director 
it's called the BHAG, Big Hairy Audacious Goal, uh, three years ago to be carbon neutral on my farm by the end of this year and expand it to the other 11 farms supplying our creamery by the end of the decade. I've had to extend the, the, the deadline by two years. Uh, I know it's two years, one year. Anyway, um, but it's made up of uh, uh, four things, but I want to just kind of talk, focus on your question of regenerative. Um, so we have carbon farming, which is uh, adding compost to land and using animals to rotational graze and plant hedgerows and windbreaks is, um, is essentially regenerative, excuse me, regenerative agriculture, which, so they label, I think as a marketing term as both Anna and Scott have said, is that carbon farming is actually recognized internationally as one of the only ways to reverse climate change rather reduce it by sequestering carbon from the atmosphere and put it back into the ground through photosynthesis. So uh, using the more grass and more crops you grow, the more you're uh, pulling carbon from the atmosphere and put it uh, back in the soil. So using animals is, is something that really helps promote the growth. And we, um, we have a, a, the first carbon dairy to have a carbon farm plan in the United States. So that's one of our main tenants of our uh, carbon neutral plan. Um, regenerative, you know, it, it's not talking about organic practices. It's not talking about, uh, it's talking about one aspect of what uh, we need to be doing as a society. Um, and so the other parts, just quickly, the other parts of my carbon neutral plan are, um, we have a methane digester taking the manure from the cows, um, producing all electricity for the farm from the methane gas. So we capture greenhouse gas going out to the atmosphere. Well, uh, in the next week or so, we'll be the first commercial trial for feeding red seaweed to cows, which uh, feeding one to, uh, three, one to three ounces in a 45 pound diet um, will reduce their enteric methane, which is the belches, not the farts, uh, from, from cows by up to 95%. And so that's gonna be really promising. And then the, the fourth thing is that uh, we've converted our truck that feeds the cows to electric and it's powered by the cow's waste. And I'm on the finishing touches of a electric loader. So it's essentially getting off of fossil fuel. I'll stop there because I could go on forever. <laughs> Thanks, Albert. I'm really happy to have you on here as well. So I feel like a lot of times people will say that like the solution is to just grow your own food, but not everyone can grow your own food. So we need <laughs> we need other producers and processors to get that to us. Um, so regenerative ag, as we're talking about it, it's often seen as like a way to mitigate the climate crisis. And some of the top of mind symptoms of the climate crisis here in California are drought and wildfires. Um, so Scott, maybe you can answer this one first. Like, so what are some of the obvious and maybe lesser known impacts of the climate crisis in California? Uh, and yeah, I mean, as you mentioned, drought and wildfire are two very obvious um, uh, consequences of climate change. Um, very obviously on my farm, um, we currently don't have any water. Our reservoirs uh, here that we draw our irrigation from did not fill for the first time in 57 years that um, those reservoirs have been dug. I'm sure Albert can speak to that as well, being here in the North Bay. A lot of the cattle ranches and a lot of the farms out here that rely on surface rainwater catchment um, didn't capture much rain this past year. Um, so yeah, that's a very obvious, um, very intense effect of drought. Um, maybe some of the lesser seen and more invisible um, to the consumer side of it is um, the economic toll that um, aside from drought causing you know, decreased production um, the wildfires, aside from, you know, the potential disaster of a farm burning down, even if your farm is out of the disaster area, but air quality is super poor and you're a small farmer or a small rancher and you depend on direct marketing at farmer's markets, um, market sales plummet during those fire, during sometimes a month long, um, or air quality index, uh, when people don't want to go out and shop at the farmer's market. Um, and that, and more importantly than that. Uh, during that time, the, what people don't see are the workers who are out on the farms, either having to work uh, in the fields to maintain um, crops uh, productivity by keeping them harvested or tending to livestock during that time because someone's still got to take care of the animals, someone's still got to take care of the plants. 
um, and uh, you know, uh, with disaster um, insurance, a lot of you know, a lot of farms, a lot of wineries and stuff have things like disaster insurance that if uh, you know they their sales plummet or they lose their whole crop because of wildfire, then they can recuperate a lot of that. But that doesn't cover employees' wages, and a lot of times those are H two A workers or undocumented or just you know, lower class uh, economically people who are working on farms who for them to lose those months of work um, is, you know, not possible. <laughs> um, yeah. So that's maybe one of the more uh, unseen uh, impacts of climate change that is very real on the farm to the people who work here. Thank you, Scott. Uh, Albert, if you could answer that question as well. So climate change um, and the drought is actually, uh, yeah, we've seen this is what, a 1200 year drought we're going through right now. Um, I start with a positive thing. So carbon farming and the uh, uh, compost applications that we've been doing over the last decade or more. Um, actually, we with less than 12 inches of rain, we had the best pasture season that we've had. Um, we, we were supposed to buy silage, which is uh, feed for the cows for the off, you know, non pasture season uh, from a neighbor that there was nothing there. So, but we were able to harvest enough ourselves to make it through the year. So I think that's a positive part. So these quote unquote regenerative or carbon farming practices really uh, econo make an economical difference for farmers and, and for the planet. And um, and then this, uh, yes, um, so that that was positive. So the other thing around, um, well, water, I'm measuring all the water that our cows drink. So um, our cows, milking cows, which are Jersey's mostly, uh, which are the smaller brown cows, um, uh, drink about 20, less than 25 gallons per cow per day and produce about five or six gallons of milk. And uh, compared to people that, used 80 to 100 gallons of water a day and don't produce any any food. Um, but um, the, so we know what cows drink and actually the cows that aren't milking drink about 10 gallons of water a day. Um, so uh, yeah, so that's happening. And so then the wildfires have been a huge impact on us as well, um, just from, um, animal health as well as human health and um, also uh, what I've been able to what I've been recommending to the Sonoma County Wildfire Prevention and Marin County is that we need to look at using the livestock and having vegetative management plans for all uh, public and private lands over 20 acres um, so that we're actually not having grasslands with so much vegetation that causes wildfires and and then uh, have all this risk year after year when we know California is uh, prone to wildfires. So it's yes, climate change has an effect, but we need to address, manage differently how we do uh, our environment and our communities. Uh, and Anna, if you could answer that as well. So what are some of the like obvious and less known impacts of, of a climate crisis in California? Yeah, well, I'm as, as not a farmer or food producer, I'm not as in touch with it as Scott and Albert are in terms of the ways you're seeing this impact your land. But, you know, certainly, um, uh, you know, what we are all experiencing is the, in, you know, the incredible impacts we're already seeing. When I think about, I grew up here in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, I got married about a decade ago, not far from Albert's ranch and never would it ever have crossed my mind that you know the wedding might be uh, canceled because of fire season. And of course, now we see that that's, you know, how much has changed already in a decade. And, and to me, I think what this just brings up and somebody put it in the chat in commending you, Albert, on your goals for trying to actually reach carbon neutrality next year, not by 2050 um, or much later is of course, you know, I think what, what goes without saying the incredible urgency um, that we're experiencing Experiencing. So, you know, we're seeing it across um, uh, ag in the state and all the ways that you guys both have already described in terms of uh, uh, droughts, wildfires, of course, other weather shocks like incredible flooding events that we've had that also really impacts farms. Uh, and I think that I am, while it's so, um, that kind of climate grief is so real uh, in experiencing uh, how quickly 
uh, climate is changing. I am, uh, you know, I feel like I almost have to be, um, uh, 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 feel that sense of possibility that our policymakers are seeing that urgent action is needed. And so I think as you all who are working in the food space and entrepreneurs really um, thinking about how do you develop products and how do you develop systems for the kinds of things that we need to see for the kinds of food production that will actually create that kind of resiliency that you're seeing on your farm, Albert, I'm sure you're experiencing too, Scott, you know, how can we also be very loud uh, and feisty advocates uh, in the policy realm to be sure that our policymakers are taking this um, crisis as urgently uh, as they need to, and that we are not letting uh, food companies who aren't playing by the rules, who aren't doing the things that you all are doing that are going to be, that are absolutely necessary now, how do we make sure that we are pushing for the kinds of regulatory environments that makes uh, you know, those uh, 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 industrial ag players that really are contributing to the crisis that really curtails their behavior. And, and uh, I've never felt a greater sense of urgency around this um, than, you know, than, I, than we're feeling now when I think about last fall, what was it in the Bay Area? 44 days of uh, 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 poor air quality uh, because of wildfires. And this year is looking like it could be even worse. So, um, so I'll, I'll pause there, but I feel like what I'm just in hearing both of you sharing how you're seeing it in your own work and, and what we're seeing across the state. And of course, beyond California, I know many of you said you're calling in from Idaho and other states. Of course, it's happening all across, um, all across the West um, and, and of course beyond. Thank you, Anna. And I mean, you kind of touched on this already, but I'm curious to hear from y'all. What are some things that we need to consider as regenerative agriculture continues to gain traction? Um, Albert, if you'd like to start. Can you ask the question again? Sorry. Yeah. What are some things that we um, need to consider? Like we as just like people who live in the world uh, need to consider as regenerative agriculture gains traction? Um, what we need to, I think, getting the connection from where your food comes from, uh, understanding uh, farming and farming challenges. So one of the practices I've implemented here at the Creamery is that um, we work, so twice a month, dairy farms get paid for their milk by law. And so instead of mailing or direct depositing the check, we hand deliver it, some for management. And, um, and then four times a year, we get together with the farms, talk about the, how the creamer is doing challenges on the farm, but ultimately agree to a, a volume of milk that's in line with our sales. So we don't have extra milk that we have to sell at a loss that depresses the price. But for consumers, I think, I mean, 99% of us didn't grow up on farms. Um, and so how do you kind of understand farming and the challenges and the, getting to a place where we can talk about issues and common solutions. And I think that's something that's been, as a society, we've, we've, we've polarized and we haven't been able to uh, look at how we can work together to make a, a, a better future uh, for our farms. For, you know, we've lost, we went from 4.6 million dairy farms in 1940 down to less than 34,000 today, producing the same amount of milk, but it's, it's not, um, it's not, we've lost our rural communities, we've lost our farms. And so this is something that's not sustainable. So how do we kind of really get back to a place where we can uh, value uh, locally produced high quality food and farms and, and, the, and, the social, and the interconnection between people? And so, you know, we're impl impl in, uh, importing a lot of food. So, uh, you know, half our fruit, a third of vegetables, 11% of beef, 80% of our lamb, or 90% of our seafood. So, I'll stop there. Thank you, Albert. Uh, Scott? So what are some things that we need to, re to consider as regenerative agriculture gains traction? Yeah, I think one of the biggest pitfalls that I worry about with regenerative agriculture kind of gaining traction is going back to what Anna and, and what we've all been talking about and kind of the co-optation by corporate farms and, and big conventional farms to using these practices. Uh, in particular, I think a lot about uh, as a, uh, someone who grows produce, uh, not a rancher. I think a lot about like no-till agriculture. Um, and, you know, most of the people practicing no-till are actually the big conventional soy, corn, uh, grain farmers in the Midwest because they can use herbicides to terminate their crops uh, without using tillage. 
Um, and a lot of those farms are considered by many people as regenerative farms, even though they might be conventional and they're growing, um, you know, corn for uh, feed or corn syrup or ethanol, uh, which maybe other people wouldn't consider necessarily a regenerative practice. But um, if we're looking at pure carbon sequestration, a lot of those farms are actually sequestering way more carbon than I'm sequestering as a vegetable grower because you know, we haven't quite figured out the technology yet for mechanized no-till vegetable production on the West Coast, uh, where we don't have frost, terminating frost and we don't have winter rain or summer rain rather. Um, but yeah, I think one of the biggest pitfalls uh, that I worry about with this whole uh, transition towards regenerative agriculture, um, you know, I, I think we do, I'm very happy that we're moving towards this direction of valuing soil carbon sequestration. And I think we need to, to save the planet. Um, we need to realize the potential of soil carbon sequestration. Um, what I worry about is that this transition will happen in a vacuum of, again, racial equity. And it'll be another situation where we see, um, yet again, government subsidies upholding um, private land ownership by, you know, the 96% of farmland that's owned by white people in this country um, on stolen land. And, you know, when we see things like carbon tax credits or um, any sort of uh, incentive to make it possible for farmers to transition. Um, we think about land holdings being where that incentive really starts to make sense. And, uh, you know, a 2000 acre farm is going to serve to benefit much more from those transitions than a small renting, you know, farmer or rancher on a smaller parcel. Um, so I think this transition should happen um, towards more regenerative practices. It needs to happen. And we need to be having incentives, but it has to happen within the same context of we also need reparations in that context. Otherwise, we're just furthering the, the divide and, and, and pressing deeper into this massive inequality in land and wealth uh, distribution in our country along racial lines. Thanks for speaking to that, Scott. Uh, Anna? Yeah, thanks. And it's really uh, great to hear all the other comments. Uh, so what comes to mind uh, are, are three things. And, and Tiffany and I working together at Real Food Media, we often think in terms of like, what are the stories that we are telling ourselves and that we want to be sharing with others? And so I'm thinking about, for me, there's kind of three, three stories around uh, these broad questions about regenerative agriculture and climate. And first is, how can we continue to do a good job and better job at drawing these connections between food and climate. And what I mean by that is all the things you're, you know we've already been talking about today, but even broadly to really get people to understand the, the core truth that the global food system is responsible for one third of all greenhouse gas emissions. And, uh, and there's a, a new paper out from UNFAO and NASA Goddard Institute that really dives into those numbers. For those who are interested, I can put a link in the chat. But you know, more than a decade ago when I wrote my last book, Diet for a Hot Planet, I was trying to scream from the rooftops, everybody look, like there is this huge force behind climate, which is a global industrial food system that's tearing down rainforests, that's destroying peatland in Indonesia, uh, that's using synthetic fertilizer and pesticides without any controls across the Midwest and so on. And it really wasn't a big part of the climate story. That story is starting to change, but let's be sure that in addition to how we are talking about it today, the power of certain farming practices to really regenerate our soil and be part of the drawdown solution, that we are also keeping keeping that big picture in mind that there are all of these really strong forces in the global food system that unless those emissions uh, are curtailed through regulation and, and other kinds of action, that we will blow our carbon budget. Um, so that's the story number one, like this food and climate story is so important to get out there. Story two, I think is um, I'm to really be sure, oh yeah, do you have a mic sure. going on to <laughs> I think we'll have to hear points two okay. and three in the Q&A portion. Okay. Um, <laughs> because we are now just at time. Um, but really quickly, I just, I just want to end this panel by asking y'all if you could say rapid fire, what is something, a policy or action that is giving you hope? So I can start. I was on a, um, a panel, uh, excuse me, a committee to advise the Biden administration around clean energy and clean jobs. Um, and climate change. And the one proposal we put out, one of the proposals around uh, farming and agriculture was to 
uh, have a carbon farming plans for all farms in the United States uh, put out. And so that would be a basis for uh, uh, measuring carbon sequestration. And, and then we've also done an economic analysis to make it sure that, to show that farmers can actually benefit economically from these practices. On the federal scale, I would say um, the Justice for Black Farmers Act, uh, although it is tied up in lawsuits right now by um, some people who are representing people who consider themselves regenerative farmers who are uh, no-till um, Midwest grain farmers. Um, but I'm uh, optimistic that that'll get past that and, and pass through legislation. And then locally, I'm gonna drop in the chat. Um, this is uh, from the North Bay Jobs with Justice. This is just a, a petition that they just reached their 1000 mark, but definitely would be great if anybody who wants to sign on could sign on to show more support. This is just a simple five things uh, going into whenever in the next maybe few weeks, the uh, wildfires start up again in Sonoma and Marin County. Um, five protections for farm workers uh, working in the vineyards. Thanks. Great. And in the spirit of rapid fire, I was thrilled uh, to see Biden's executive order on promoting competition in the American economy. I will put it in the chat if anybody missed it. Very, uh, very exciting with implications for the food system for sure. Thank you. Wow. Thank you so much, everybody. I, this time just flew by and just deep gratitude for this very real discussion. I would say, you know, applause virtually. We would all love to give you a little hug just to thank you for all the important work you do around climate action and food and agriculture. And also, you know, shout out to all of you who dropped ideas and questions and resources in the chat. Let's, let's all continue this discussion together. And um, I know there's tons of questions from the audience. So what we're gonna do now, you have the opportunity to meet Albert, Anna and Scott in a breakout session.